When Jesus left this earth, he left us with a surprising message. First, my kingdom is not of this world. You are not of this world. But second, I want you to be in the world. I want you to be salt and light, a sweet smelling aroma in a world that doesn't know any different. What does that look like? What does it mean to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a lost and dying world? Join us as we ask, what does it mean to be the church before the watching world? Politics is nothing new. Aristotle wrote a gigantic book called Politics, and he did something brilliant. He said, if you look deep down within yourself, you'll notice different sides of you. You have a reason part. You've got an emotional part. You've got a spirited part. And if you're going to make a state, you should make a state that resembles what's going on inside of you. And so, you need a reasoned part. That's the legislators. And you need an emotional part. That's the artisans. And you need a spirited part. That's the guardians. I'll show you what I think is so brilliant about this. What he was saying is, what goes on in the world really is, and in some ways should be, an outgrowth, an outward manifestation of what's going on inside. Isn't that true? You show me your politics, your view of the world, how it is and how it should be. And I will tell you a lot about what's going on inside. Turns out that politics is something that God does and always has cared about. If you read your Old Testament, you'll see that God is involved in the rise and fall of nations and kingdoms. You find it starting in Deuteronomy, but you can find it all the way down through, uh, through the rest of the Old Testament of God saying to and about other nations, I'm involved. And with his own nation, Israel, way back in Genesis, he founds his own nation and he calls it a kingdom. This idea that God cares about what's going on in the world is just so very obvious. And if it's obvious to God, if it's important to God, it ought to be important to us. Israel was a theocracy. Now, let me explain what a theocracy is and how different that is from a democracy. This is a political system where economic issues and social issues and religious issues were all melded into one. So, you know, in our country, we have a president in the White House. We have Congress in their own house, both in Washington. And we also have a federal bank reserve. We have a Wall Street. Wall Street's up in New York. And we have something uh, like a separation of church and state. No official church anywhere dictating the official religious views for the country. And even if we did, uh, they'd be separate things. All talking to each other, looking for compromise to sell to the people. But in the theocracy of Israel... The White House, the Senate, Wall Street, the state church, they were all in the same place. They weren't all just in Jerusalem. They were all in the temple. The temple was where you got all of your social and economic and religious perspective. And it was all the same thing the Mosaic law of God. And God declared himself to be king. And this means that when God's people, Israel, went after other gods, it wasn't just a religious move. It was a political move. It was an announcement that I like, I want something other than what comes through the Mosaic law of God. Something that would help me decide the laws of my life and the laws of the land. And 
When there was a complete denial of God, it was called apostasy. But that didn't happen as often as you might imagine. More often than not, there was a blending where you say, give me God for my religion and give me Baal's economic policy and give me Asherah's social platform. And the official name for this is syncretism. Now, there were some things about a theocracy that didn't transfer. For example, when, when God spoke against other nations, he never said to them, now I want to make sure that you're keeping Sabbath holy. And I want to make sure that you have regular feast days and that you regularly worship at the temple. He didn't say that because even though those were his laws, those were covenant laws meant for his covenant people, Israel. But God still owns the entire world. Every human being is made in God's image and God is Lord of heaven and earth. And so he still held everybody in the world to a standard. The standard was God's moral law. He placed it in creation, and he placed it in their heart, and you can find it all through the prophets where God says, these people who don't know my name, these people who are not held to God's covenant law, they need to be held accounted because of how they treat their fellow man. We see both of these stories at work in the prophets. Israel is called to return to the Lord to the Mosaic law of God, to follow his commandments, to keep covenant with God and to love each other. And to everyone on the planet, not just Israel, God calls for humility in leadership. He calls for accountability. He calls for justice. He cares for the poor. He wants protection for widows and orphans. He wants goodness to flourish. And he wants love to guide all decisions. And for all these reasons and more, I can understand why Christians are drawn to politics. I can understand why Christians are drawn to country as well as to God. I am nothing but grateful to both of my grandparents who served in the military for this country. I am grateful for members of my family who are buried in Arlington National Cemetery. In my coat pocket, I carry with me all the time, whenever I wear this coat, the little piece of paper they handed out at my grandfather's funeral. Sergeant in the Army, and he got a gun salute by people who were so grateful for what he did. I do think that there is something like a debilitating hubris that looks at history only through the lens of a series of failures and never appreciating successes. And I think there's something that is both in gratitude and dishonor to not appreciate the fact, as our brother Goldman said in his prayer, that we live in a country that allows us to worship God freely and there's a reason for that. And some of the people who have helped make that happen are in our audience this morning. Honor to whom honor is due, gratitude upon gratitude, loving your neighbor. These seem to be very obvious Christian truths. We have Christians who are at every level of political leadership. And I think a very good case can be made for why that's a meaningful and rewarding job. The challenge for all of us, though, is to never see any of that as our calling. You see, politics isn't just about public service in the interest of protecting widows and orphans. Political lobbying is now a $4 billion industry with people working full-time to create and promote an us-versus-them view of the world. For them, politics is about winning and losing. It's about kill or be killed. It's about survival of the fittest. And this is where we find the great dilemma. America has a long history of Judeo-Christian thinking. It's in our language. It's in our roots. You might say it's in our DNA. I'm always baffled and saddened 
when people who do not believe in God want to appreciate, live in, and build on the fruit that has only come because of Judeo-Christian roots. At the same time, we also have some deeply pagan impulses. Birthed in rebellion, we've become students of Nietzsche just as much as we've become students of Jesus. Think about it. In our average daily lives, we think that people should love one another, they should be forgiving, they should overlook faults, and they should value peace. But we also think that might makes right. Protect yourself at all costs. Selfish greed is the path to success. This two-headed animal has existed for a long time, but we used to call it syncretism. Nearly a century ago, a British missionary named Leslie Newbegin left England and went to India, and he was there for several decades. When he came back, he found a very different Britain than the one he had left. He found that uh, even though everybody was still using language and symbols and signs of a Christian culture, he was now living in a post-Christian culture. It was like the whole culture had gone on autopilot, enjoying the fruit of this tree that no longer had very deep roots. And Newbegin made a prediction. He said, humans need something to worship. So if they don't worship Jesus of Nazareth, a post-Christian culture will make politics their new religion. In 2018, an article appeared in New York Magazine with a fascinating quote. He said, look at our politics. On the right and the left, what you find is groups that resemble worshipers. And the author said, they practice a religion whose followers show the same zeal as any born-again evangelical. They're filling the void that Christianity once owned without any of the wisdom and culture and restraint that Christianity once provided. And it's not just non-Christians who've turned to religion to take the place of, in their lives that Christianity once occupied. Not long ago, I read a book that made a very bold claim. It said the churches of the future, and in many ways, some churches of today, will not be grouped by theological conviction, but by political persuasion. Churches will feel an affinity with each other, not because of the carried cross, but because of the ballot box. Have you found this to be shockingly accurate? I can't tell you how many conversations I've had over the last mm, five, eight years where people have left the church to join a new one, not because of theological convictions, but because they did or didn't like the politics that was being espoused from the pulpit. I wish I could say that most of those travelers were weary of hearing political speeches, but that wasn't it. They wanted to hear the rallying cry for their side, and they were church shopping based on party platform. Just a few months ago, a report came out that said half, half of self-identified evangelicals now worship at a church less than once a month. But since we have to worship something, where do they gather in order to share their shared convictions and to express glory and honor and praise, which is what worship is? And the author says, well, you see it at political rallies. Something's going on. It seems we've grown bored with the gospel, and we have found a much more attractive alternative. We can test this out. In the fourth century, people would stand in bread lines, and they would talk with each other about the major issues of the day. You know, as you're waiting for bread, you pick up People magazine, where theirs was whatever the Roman word for people is, and they'd pick that up, and they'd be reading this, and what were they discussing? What was the most obvious issues of the day that everybody was talking about? 
Well, things like this. When you take the Lord's Supper, is it a representation of the body and blood of the Lord, or does it actually turn into the body and blood of the Lord? Everybody talked about it all the time, everywhere. The most cultural influences in the 1400s and 1500s, we're talking centuries later, was the same. If you want to take any class in, for example, politics, I took a class in England in politics run by non-believers, and we read Augustine's City of God. Major church leaders were still the major people you went to when you wanted to ask major issues going on in the culture, all the way up to the 1600s. But go online this afternoon and share your views on any subject, on any platform you want, having to do with theology. And I predict that nothing bad's going to happen to you. You might not even get a reaction. But get on social media this afternoon and Weigh in on gun control or school choice. Say your thoughts about vaccines or student loan forgiveness. How about the Presidential Records Act or a certain politician's son's laptop? Oh, I don't know. Share your thoughts about a certain Arkansas education bill. And you'll have more comments than you can imagine and less friends than you had before you started. What's happening in our culture is a religious shift, and it goes by the name politics. Listen to the language. Yesterday, it was a crusade. Now it's a culture war. We once found our talking points in Scripture and Orthodox theology. Now we get our marching orders from your favorite talking head at late night. Or you get your bullet points in your inbox every morning by the political party of your choice. And we are spending very much time asking the standard questions of Christian theology. We're not asking that. We want our preachers, our Bible classes, our gatherings during the week to state clearly about where they are on the political issues of the day. Are you a conservative? Are you a liberal? Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? If you're on the right, you feel almost a divine calling to return our country back to its former greatness. If you're on the left, you feel almost a divine calling to create some sort of utopia that you squeeze everybody into based upon your best guess of what that might look like. And possibly something worse. I want to show you a quote from a popular politician. The national government will maintain and defend the foundations on which the power of our nation rests. It will offer strong protection to Christianity as the very basis of our collective morality. Today, Christians stand at the head of our country. We want to fill our culture again with the Christian spirit. We want to burn out all the recent immoral developments in literature, in entertainment, and in the press. In short, we want to burn out the poison of immorality which has entered into our whole life and culture as a result of liberal excess during recent years. Does that sound good? Does it sound like someone you want to vote for? Let's go further. Does it sound like someone whose campaign you'd work for? Does it sound like a cause worth giving your life for? I only ask because it's from a radio address given back on July 22nd, 90 years ago, by a young rising star named Adolf Hitler. And it worked. Germany was a democracy, and Hitler carried the Christian vote. Do you know what Hitler did as soon as he became in power? He outlawed pornography. He protected and promoted his version of Christian liberty. And all the churches that agreed with him joined him in rooting out all the others. After all, Germany was supposed to be a Christian nation. Their leader Hitler said so. And when he led his country to war, a war 
against the rest of the world. He framed it as a culture war. And there was one nation who went to war with the phrase, God with us on every belt buckle. But it was in German. You know, I've lived as a church-going Christian in many states and in several countries. And here's been my experience. I've heard lots of sermons on Romans 13 that we should obey the government. We should pay our taxes. Anarchy is wrong. You should never speak ill of your country. After all, where's respect for authority? And you never say you're ashamed of it. But those sermons were almost always when one party was in the White House. When a different party was in the White House, I heard sermon after sermon from Acts 5, we must obey God rather than men, from the prophets declaring national shame for a country that's left their first love, or Revelation 17, that government's Babylon. The truly ironic thing is that which party I'm talking about differed depending on where I was living. 1 Kings chapter 12 Scripture tells a very revealing story about King Jeroboam. You may remember his brother Rehoboam had taken over the kingdom from their father Solomon, but he was carrying out very oppressive policies. So Jeroboam rallied the troops. He declared that 10 of the 12 tribes should secede from the nation, and they did so. Jeroboam became king over them, and since that was now the majority rule, they also took the name they called themselves Israel, leaving the two tribes that didn't go to be called Judah. But any smart leader knows that a nation created by rebellion will always be living with the threat of rebellion. So to bolster his street cred and to increase security and to consolidate power, Jeroboam made two golden calves and he placed them at both ends of his kingdom. And then he called his people together. And he said, you used to go up to Jerusalem to worship God. You've done that long enough. You don't need to do that anymore. Behold your gods. And if you read his speech, everything in his speech sounds so much like Moses on Sinai. But what he was doing looks exactly like the people at the base of Sinai, rejecting the law of Moses. He was creating a new national religion that was really a thin veneer for state power. And because it used the same language of Moses, because it had priests like Moses, because it had festivals like Moses, it had the subtle effect of convincing the people that whatever Jeroboam wanted to do must be divine mandate. Instead of leading his people to humbly submit to God and follow his laws, he was using the language and symbols of Israel's God to declare the kingdom and the power and the glory belong to the state. Is it really a surprise that a hundred years later, Amos comes to this exact place and he declares, God is very upset with who you are and what you're doing. And the priest then looks at Amos and says, get out of here. This is the king's sanctuary. This is the king's kingdom. Behold the religious shift. Rather than the nation serving the interests of God, the language and symbols of religion have been co-opted to serve the interests of of a nation. The story of Judah doesn't fare any better. They too saw the overwhelming power, the financial stability, the economic security of all the nations around them like Assyria, and they were smart, and they were ruthless, and they were powerful. And Ahaz and Manasseh wanted to be just like them. And the more they adopted the ways of Assyria, the worse the nation became but they still claimed to be God's nation. Do you know what both nations suffered from? Babel syndrome. They were trying to make their own name great. 
They forgot that only God can make someone's name great, and he promised that he would make their name great. Trying to provide for their own security, they forgot that God was the only security blanket they would ever need. The good news is that the church has within it the DNA to answer Babel syndrome. Look deep down within yourself and ask yourself this question. Have you found it spiritually satisfying to live with deep anxiety about what's happening in the world? Is the news station that you watch religiously really aiding you in developing the fruit of the Spirit? Do you find it spiritually exhausting keeping up with all the sordid details involved in the gossip about the other side of the political aisle? And does it help you see with the eyes of Jesus when you realize that the people on that side of the aisle are now sitting with you on this aisle? Could it be that we have become more passionate about a political party's vision for our country than Jesus' vision for his kingdom? Believe it or not, God doesn't call us to be less political. Oh, no. I believe he calls us to be more political because the church is a signpost of the kingdom and the kingdom of God is its own politic. It's its own vision of the world. It's its own understanding of the way things should be, and we take our marching orders from one and only one king. Not a democracy, a benevolent dictatorship, and our God sits under no flag. He is Lord over all of them. When I was in my early 20s, I went up to Washington, D.C. to try out one of the churches to be a youth minister. If you don't know me that well, this may not make sense. If you know me very well, you'll understand. I really wanted this job. I thought I had this job. I loved hanging out with the elders. We talked about theology. We enjoyed each other's company. I spent a little bit of time with the youth, but mostly hanging out with the elders. When it was all done, I said, so do I get the job? And they said, "Uh, no. And I said, why not? They said, we love you. If you want to be the preacher here, that would be great. But as my son said at the lock-in about you, he's a great guy, but we would run all over him. I didn't get the youth ministry job. But I will always remember this story they told me. In the mid-90s, the politics in D.C. were hmm, pretty tough. There was a transition happening as George Bush's administration was leaving and Bill Clinton's was coming in. And it wasn't just a political change. It was a cultural change, all kinds of things going on. And there was bad blood between people. And they said right there on the second row, Colin Powell's personal secretary sat right next to Hillary Clinton's personal secretary. In the midst of the warring world, you saw a glimpse of the kingdom of God. It reminded me of something right after the Civil War. Right after the Civil War, there was no name worse, no name hated more in the North than Jefferson Davis. And in the South, there was no name of a living person hated more than Ulysses S. Grant. When both those men died, their widows moved next door to each other and became the best of friends and joined hands in trying to heal the nation. I see the seeds of the kingdom of God growing in the midst of the kingdoms of the world. The kingdom of God can be found in every country, consisting of those of every tribe and tongue and nation. And do you know what that means? It means the kingdom of God includes people who think differently than I do, who vote differently than I do even those who don't vote at all, even those who've never heard of either political party in our country because they don't live in our country. May we hear the primary call of the church. First, submit to the reign of God. 
The kingdom of God is all around us. Yes, we see crime and poverty and violence and suffering and death. But like a mustard seed, the kingdom of God takes root in the most unlikely of soils and it grows and grows and grows. Let's never be naive. The kingdom of God will always be a threat to the kingdoms of the world. And it's not because we're the worst citizens. As I understand it, Paul says to Festus, uh, to Felix, we are the best citizens. We will treat each other better than anybody else in your nation. But it's not because we serve you. It's because we're of service to our king. And our king says to die for others. It's what makes non-believers who were leaders in the first century say, these are really good people. I wish we had more people like this. Well, then why are they a threat? Because at the end of the day, after being really good to their neighbors, they say, but I want you to know, we do not think that you're king. We have one king. We have one king. The leading figures who gathered to condemn Jesus were not just the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the chief priests. Read the Gospels carefully. They collude with the Herodians the governors, the Roman guards. Jesus was a threat to political power. And that's why when he was called before Pilate, Pilate said, so you're a king. Christians declare that Jesus is Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, then Caesar isn't. And if we give all of our allegiance to the kingdom of God, then our citizenship is in heaven. And wherever we live on the earth, we are ultimately vagabonds and aliens. After submitting to the reign of God, the second thing we do is we submit to the mission of God. The Great Commission is our mission, and we're called to have tired feet in this world. We teach people to obey the word of the Lord. There's no need to chase after other gods for safety or security. Jesus says, for I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. We've been commissioned to be on mission, to see the world through kingdom eyes. And that means living out the politics of Jesus. Jesus saw prostitutes and tax collectors as dinner companions. He dined with Pharisees, and he blessed Roman centurions, and he told his followers, lift up your eyes, for the fields are white for harvest. When we lift up our eyes, what do we see? Over 40% of Americans view the opposing political party as downright evil. That means out of 10 people at the checkout kiosks at Walmart, four of them, most people see as your mortal enemy. Bob Turner preaches at uh, White Station in Memphis, and he added this very poignant point. We shouldn't be surprised that the number of teenagers who experience depression has doubled in the past decade, or why their parents and grandparents are tragically suffering from the death of despair. The demand for clicks and votes has drained people of a renewing belief in a higher power in exchange for a God who makes all things new. We're left with culture wars and political bargains that promise demonization, cancellation, and polarization. For me, I'd rather have faith and hope and love. The great news is that God has provided the alternative. He calls it the church. So let's be the church. Let's live out the politics of Jesus. I want to read something to you as we close that makes no sense to any political platform. Every political platform seeks to have power and control over. You can't exist without it. Listen to Jesus from Luke 6. To you who are ready for the truth, I say this, love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the moves of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap the best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more payback. Here's a simple rule of behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you 
then take the initiative and do it for them. Love your enemies. Help and give without expecting in return. I promise you'll never forget it. Live out this God-created identity the way the Father lives towards us, who is gracious to us even when we're at our worst. What would happen if the politics of Jesus invaded our lives? I believe the world would see something they've never seen before. They'll see what made the church grow from 0.001% of the population to 56% of the population when the church had zero power and was facing a more hostile culture than we've ever seen. What they saw was the politics of Jesus Christ lived out in the kingdom of God. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions or just want to drop us a line, write to us at prayers at wschurch.net. Thank you again. God bless you and tune in next week.